Um, it was infected, totally infected. The shoulder side was loose. Uh, yeah, that was what was causing me all my pain. It was just in there flopping around, grinding around, and it totally destroyed my rotator cuff. So um, they put a concrete spacer in to hold all the tendons where they belong, and they did not put the shoulder side back in. So basically, I don't have a shoulder joint right now. I've just got something sticking up out of my arm that's all attached to everything to, to make sure that the tendons stay where they're supposed to be so they can do the fourth surgery and put my shoulder back four to six months from now. Um, and. So yeah, it's been a, it's been a fun week. It's been a fun nine months, ten months now with dealing with this. But uh, there are other people who have a lot worse problems than I do. Um, and I want you to all to remember to pray for Bert. Uh, Bert, would you stand up so everybody can see? I don't want to embarrass you. Um, Bert has had esophageal cancer before, and uh, it's back. And they're going to have to be starting to treat him pretty soon. So I would ask that you to pray for him and everybody else in our church that needs a touch, whether it's physical, spiritual, emotional. Uh, financial, whatever it is, we we need God, don't we? We need God. We do. We need His touch in our lives, and we need His hand on our lives. And you know, it's an amazing thing to know that, boy, wherever we go, no matter what we go through, we can still trust in God. Uh, we look at what's going around in our culture and in our in the politics of our world today, and God is still working, whether we can see it up front and out in front of us or not. He's still there. He's still working, and He needs us to be the ones who are his hands outreach to the world and you know julie got diagnosed with ms not too long ago and it just seems like the devil's doing everything he can to try to pick people off one at a time um, and so we want to be a family we want to be god's people on mission for him doing his business serving him loving him and being filled by his spirit don't we yes, yes we do um, so we're going to pray the girls are going to introduce these songs and uh, then we're going to uh, turn it over and Ken's going to come and introduce your guest speaker today. Father God, we thank you for this day. We thank you for your amazing love. We thank you for not only the fact that Jesus was born and put on human flesh so that we could understand God. and He was tempted in every way that we were tempted, yet he didn't sin. He, he touched people's lives. He made them whole. And he's still doing that today, God. Jesus, you're still changing people. But more importantly, we thank you for the fact that you sacrificed your life that you laid down on that cross after being humiliated and beaten and whipped and all those things that were done to you and you you laid down on that cross and you you prayed father forgive them for they don't know what they do and you prayed it over and over and over again father forgive them father forgive them and that's your grace and that's your mercy poured into our lives and god as we trust in you as we believe in you as we experience that grace and that mercy Lord, we don't thank you enough, and we don't praise you enough. And then, Jesus, when you rose from the grave, triumphant and victorious, and you took the keys of death, hell, and the grave, that gives us hope beyond this life. Your word says that because you raised from the dead, those who belong to you will also raise from the dead, and will spend eternity with you in heaven, where there's no sickness, where there's no sorrow, where there's no sadness, where there's no pain, where there's no sickness and illness. God, we, we need you. We need you every day in our lives. We don't thank you far enough for the things that you've done for us. And Lord, I pray that before we leave this place today, that somebody would understand what an amazing God you are. Somebody would turn their life over to you one more piece, one step deeper, so that they can experience what it is that you've been holding for them all this time. Father, if there's somebody here who's never given their life to you, if they've never said, God, forgive me, help me to live for you, Father, I pray that you would speak to their heart through the power of your Holy Spirit. And Lord, I pray that you would be glorified, that you would be honored in this place. our first time um, to do a little skit. Um, instead of singing, we chose to do this. So um, it's short, uh, but I know they'll do a good job. And so just bear with us for a second.
see me? Oh yeah, we're really excited to see you. <laughs> what are you guys talking about? We're talking about Easter. Excited to see me? We're excited to see you, but you know what this is all about. I'm not? No, you're not. <laughs> we were reading how the disciples got the biggest surprise on the first Easter morning. Be looking at the first ten verses this morning. 
I want to get there. How many of you remember the story of Barabbas? Pontius Pilate holding his court, really wanting to be able to release Jesus. And it was a custom every year that uh, one of the prisoners would actually be parked and released. Pilate says to the religious leaders, who do you want, Jesus, who is called the Christ, or Barabbas? Barabbas was an insurrectionist against the government. In other words, he charged it into the Capitol building, I guess. Uh, and he was also a murderer. And Pilate gave him the option. You want Jesus, or you want Barabbas. They wanted Barabbas. And they said, what do you want to do with Jesus? And that's when they said, crucify him. So, to give you a little background on me, for all intents and purposes, I'm Barabbas. Jesus Christ died for me. So the question that needs to be answered today is, who benefits from the resurrection? And the obvious answer should be everyone benefits from the resurrection. If you breathe air, you should benefit from the resurrection. And you should benefit from the fact that Christ rose from the dead. But some people don't see it that way. Some people don't pay any attention to the gospel. Today, for them, is about bunnies and candy. And I understand bicycles were involved in the little kids, too. But um, a lot of people, they just don't care about the resurrection of Jesus Christ. But the Lord cares. And aren't we blessed that he does? Yes. The Lord cares. He cares so much that he died on a cross for us. And he cared so much that he gives us every opportunity to repent and turn to him. Uh, in 2 Peter 3, 9, it says, The Lord isn't really slow about his promise, as some people think. No, he is being patient for your sake. He does not want anyone to be destroyed, but wants everyone to repent. You know, I never realized that when I was younger. I got saved later in life. Uh, I was under the impression that if I did good things, if the good things outweighed the bad, then i got to tell you, it depended on the day, whether the good outweighed the bad a lot of times. Uh, I thought if I was being nice, that I had to be nice to nice people. I wasn't going to be nice to any of the bad people. I was just going to be nice to the nice people. If I go to church once in a while, uh, if I would pray about stuff whenever I was really in a bind, I'm here to tell you there were times when I was in a bind, the only prayer I knew was the Lord's Prayer. I had prayed that thing up one side and down the other. And just hoping that God was going to uh, take care of business for me one more time. And you know what? The Lord truthfully wants everyone to be saved. He does not anyone, want anyone to go to hell. <clears throat> and the funny thing is, <clears throat> in my former life, I, I never realized that I didn't have to do anything. <clears throat> I, my good works were not going to get me into heaven. Christ had already did it for me on the cross at Calvary. And uh, for me, the truth be told, I did not have a relationship with Jesus Christ. I knew about the Lord. I had heard things about him. I, hey, I even picked my Bible up and read it once in a while. But uh, while I knew about the Lord, I didn't know the Lord. Uh, I only talked to him, honestly, when I needed something, as, as a lot of people do. And my life was a life about doing whatever I wanted to do because I wasn't hurting anybody. And uh, my life was also a life of hard work. My dad taught me several values that stick with me today that he taught me when I was a little kid. And my dad was a pretty hard guy. Uh, as part of his generation, that's how it was. My dad taught me a couple of things about work, my work ethic. Number one, show up on time. In fact, show up early. Number two, don't be a goofball. My dad had no tolerance for a goofball. And then finally, number three, 
uh, stay extra and do more work if you have to. And that's what he taught me. While all my kids, all my friends when I was a kid were out playing, Dad had me doing things. True story, I had a broken wrist from a football injury one time. Next day, my dad has me out there carrying cinder blocks. Neighbor comes over and says to my dad, what's wrong with you? Can't you see his arms broke? He said, ain't nothing wrong with that other arm. Yeah. <laughs> <clears throat> um, honestly, as I got older, and got away from that, as often does whenever a person goes to college, they get away from the values the family taught them. And on the outside, still hearing about Jesus, every once in a while somebody witnessed to me through a college ministry or something like that. Uh, on the outside, it seemed as if Jesus was cramping my style. But the truth be told, on the inside, I did not think I was good enough to be a Christian, to be a Christ follower. And the truth be told, a lot of people don't think they're good enough. And as today's message text is, is going to reveal, Jesus didn't die a cruel death on the cross so that only certain people would get into heaven. The death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ was to give everyone a chance to decide to be saved. So let's go ahead and look at John's Gospel. I'm going to cover the first two verses. Early on Sunday morning, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb and found that the stone had been rolled away from the entrance. She ran and found Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one whom Jesus loved. She said, they have taken the Lord's body out of the tomb. We don't know where they have put him. Okay, all four gospel accounts of the resurrection of Jesus Christ confirmed that Mary Magdalene went to the tomb on the first day of the week, and she found the stone and rolled away. All accounts confirm that she reported to the disciples that the stone was rolled away. But only John's account verifies that Peter and John were disciples that ran to the tomb that heard Mary Magdalene's report. I don't know about you, but I find it very interesting that the Lord knew ahead of time that these three people would be the ones, the first ones, to see that he had risen from the dead. You have Mary Magdalene, you have Peter, you have John, the one whom Jesus loved. These three were not there just by chance. There is no uh, fooling God. And I've had people tell me over the years, uh, whenever you, you make a statement about, well, I don't think God knew that we were going to turn out like such like this. That's the idea. He knows everything, so you can't think about God in our terms. We've got to think about it in his terms. Uh, <clears throat> when I look at each of them, I start to see a pretty clear picture of why divine intervention brought the three of them to an empty grave. And uh, everything took place just as Jesus said it would. See, Mary Magdalene uh, had a very short but significant role in this story. And for all intents and purposes, and some of you may disagree, she was the first evangelist. She was an evangelist to the apostles. But here's the thing. She also had a dark side. Mark 16, 9 says, Now when, Mary, well, when he rose early on the first day of the week, he appeared first to Mary Magdalene, out of whom he had cast seven demons. I'm not real sure what kind of person has seven demons in them. And I'm not sure what kind of damage a person with seven demons in them could do. But Jesus removed them and she became a faithful follower of our Lord. Uh, I don't have any idea of what kind of person she was before she met Jesus. But when you've got seven demons in there running around, I can't imagine she was a model citizen. <laughs> But uh, when Jesus came into her life, cast out the demons, she became a true servant of the living God. She was one of the last ones at the cross, and she was one of the first ones to the tomb the next, whenever uh, three days had passed. She may not have started out well, but she finished strong. Mary gives us a vivid picture of a lot of believers today. 
when people with sordid backgrounds, bad reputations come in contact with the risen Savior, their life is forever changed. So who are the people that benefit from the resurrection? The first group of people that benefit from the resurrection? Broken people benefit from the resurrection. What do I mean by broken people? Broken people are the type of people that have their heart broken. They just don't care about anything anymore. People with broken marriages benefit from the resurrection. People with broken bodies benefit from the resurrection. People with broken spirits benefit from the resurrection. There's no doubt Mary Magdalene was a person of bad reputation prior to meeting Jesus. People with seven demons inside of them are not nice people. They don't necessarily do good things. We also have people, uh, Pastor Ron alluded to the seven sons of Sceva last week, and it kind of reminded me of something. These guys come in and toyed with a demon-possessed person that got the fire beat out of them. You don't mess with demon-possessed people on your own. Matthew, Mark, and Luke's Gospels talk about the gathering demonic. He went around cutting himself on stones. He attacked people. The, pe the townspeople tried to put him in shackles and chains, and he just broke out of those chains. There was no holding him. And uh, the truth is, you don't have to be demon-possessed to benefit from resurrection. Broken people of all types. And I'm going to tell you something right now. None of us here today should be naive enough to think that everybody here today has got it all together. You see, when I didn't think I was good enough to come to Jesus, Jesus don't meet you whenever you're good enough. Jesus will meet you at your place of pain. He'll meet you at your place of hurting. He'll come to you when you call him. It doesn't matter where you are in life. And none of us here today should be that naive to think that every one of us here got it all together. Let's go ahead and move on to verses 3 and 4. Peter and the other disciple started out to the tomb. They were both running, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. He stooped and looked in and saw the linen wrappings lying there, but he didn't go in. Okay, the Bible offers no explanation for why John decided to put these uh, sentences here, or why John found this important. I'm thinking, okay, maybe Peter was weighed down by guilt. Possibly the stress of denying the Lord had exhausted him. Uh, perhaps John wanted to brag that he finally beat Peter at something because they were competitive. Come on. They were fishermen. How many fishermen we got in here? You fish tournaments, you are very competitive in these tournaments. Hot people's floors on and everything else. These guys were businessmen in competition with each other. Uh, John may have been younger. Uh, possibly his faith was stronger. But I did a lot of study on this. I went through all the Greek and the Aramaic. I looked up the old ancient texts and poured over uh, the information that was available to me. And I came up with this conclusion on why John outran Peter to the town. Are you ready for this? Are you ready? Tell me you're ready. You're ready. Scott was a faster runner. <laughs> Hey, you, you gave an offering for that one. <laughs> Let's talk about Peter for a minute, though. Peter was proud, he was loud, and he always had to be first, he always had to be right, he had all the answers, and sometimes he got it right, sometimes he did not. He was the one, Jesus says, who do you say I am? You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. 
few minutes later, it's no Lord, that's never going to happen to you. They won't crucify you. A few minutes after being told, blessed are you, Simon Peter, for you are correct, and upon this rock I will build my church, meaning his name, Rock. A few minutes, Peter, all full of himself, says, yeah, they're not going to do that to you, Lord. That's never going to happen. And get behind me, Satan. Second group of people who benefit from the resurrection, proud people benefit from the resurrection. People filled with pride. Uh, Peter, before the resurrection, was probably the type of person that would annoy me. But I don't like, I, I feel a big feeling people, it is great on my gears the wrong way. Uh, I don't like the show, though. I'm always partial to the person who quietly goes about their business and takes care of business every day. Uh, but because I'm full of sin and pride myself, I kind of get a little bit of an amusement out of the fact when people fall on their faces that are proud and full of themselves. And uh, the truth is, no matter, the, the truth of the matter is, people who lack humility, People that are proud and full of themselves are in the church today. And I know this to be true because I used to be one. I loved having my name on the church sign. Pastor Wayne, I'm super Christian. <laughs> but you don't have your name on a sign. <laughs> Look at me. I'm, I'm a super Christian. I got my name on the church sign. I love to name drop. Pastor Wayne, call somebody up. Need some haste, hey, Pastor Wayne. <laughs> I once told my wife if I bought a black shirt with a white collar, I had so much authority, the hospital would let me walk in on brain surgeries. <laughs> That's how full of it I was. But I'm here to tell you, when you get full of yourself <laughs> with pride, the Lord has a way of bringing it out of you. And for me, it was a cancer diagnosis last year. When you have cancer and you're in the hospital and they got you hooked up to all these tubes and places better left unhooked, you know what I mean? Uh, modesty goes out the window. And for me, being the big feeling super Christian that I thought I was, to have to have my wife take care of me is unheard of. But that is what took me from being the proud, full myself Christian to being the humble Christ follower that I am today. I used to love to come up here and strut around like a peacock for everybody and preach the gospel and get loud, be proud, and having everybody like me and having my name on the sign. Uh, Pastor Ron asked me about this. Yes, I, I'm going to back up my pastor in any way I can. The truth of the matter is, I was praying that he would get out of the hospital early and everything would be great and he could be up here preaching because this is not an easy thing up here whenever you're humbling yourself before God. I mean, you all don't scare me. I'm sorry you don't. <laughs> but what I say in front of him, that's what scares me because i got to give an account for that one day. But like I said, when you fail to humble yourself, the Lord will do it for you. And Peter alludes to this so, uh, in 1 Peter 5, verse 6. So humble yourselves under the mighty power of God, and at the right time, He will lift you up in honor. Friends, Jesus Christ did not die on a cross for us so that the spotlight would be shined on us. He is the one who said we are lights of the world. Yes, we are, but we are a reflective light of Christ's glory. None of us have any reason to think of ourselves more highly than we ought to. We are not better than unsaved people. We're saved. We're going to heaven. We have the, we have the information we need to go to heaven. 
Christ followers are not better than unsaved people by a long shot. And I, but I like how the Apostle Paul thought. He said, I've become all things to all people so that some might be saved. But the truth is, Peter also had some beneficial qualities. Let's go ahead and look at verses 6 and 7. Then Simon Peter arrived and went inside. He also noticed the linen wrappings lying there, while the cloth that had covered Jesus' head was folded up, lying apart from the other wrappings. John got to the tomb first, but Peter went into the tomb first. John was always willing to take things so far that he stopped. But Peter, uh, he boldly would just burst into anything. He was always the first one to pipe us an answer. Uh, he is the one who took things to the limit. But I'm going to tell you something. I believe that guilt forced Peter into that tomb because if it was true that Jesus was alive, he was going to have to face him sooner or later for what he had done. He had denied the Lord three times just like Jesus said he did. Peter displays another quality that could be useful in the church today, and that is boldness. Third type of people that benefit from the resurrection. Bold people benefit from the resurrection. Peter was bold to the point that he got him in trouble with uh, Jesus occasionally prior to the resurrection. After the resurrection, Peter was the one who took a stand for the sake of the gospel. You look in Acts chapter 2. Don't turn there. You can look at that on your own time. But, uh, Acts chapter 2. The Holy Spirit come at Pentecost. All the apostles were filled with the Spirit. And they, got, they stood up and began to speak in other languages, boldly proclaiming uh, that Christ had risen from the dead and uh, how glorious it was and what men needed to do to be saved, what people needed to do to be saved. And then uh, there were people outside saying, yeah, they're drunk. They've been drinking new wine. They're, they're loaded. Peter was the first one that stood up. I said, Peter stood up with the rest of the apostles. Peter brought the wood. He preached like a 300-word message to these people. 3,000 people got saved. That's power, man. That's boldness of, of Peter. He was the first one to stand up to the accusations. In Acts 4.19... Peter stood up to the religious leaders and said, don't you dare preach in Jesus' name anymore. Whether it is right for us to listen to God or listen to you, you decide. i got to tell you something, friends. People didn't say stuff like that back in those days. They didn't talk to the religious leaders like that. Boldness. Bo the bold people. The thrill seekers. Any thrill seekers in here? Any daredevils? <laughs> Dirt bikes? Skateboards, anything like that? And everybody's raising their hand. You all aren't bold. Uh, but uh, you, they benefit from the resurrection. A saved person can use that boldness for the sake of the gospel. I ex when I accepted Jesus Christ as the Lord of my life, the following day, after I did this, I made it official in the church, and I went out and started witnessing to people. I had the audacity to believe that that was what I was supposed to be doing. I was supposed to be going out and sharing Christ with people. Everything that I read said, hey, you got to be a witness for Christ. I was out there doing it. I'd pigeonhole people in the Walmart line. Oh, man, the Walmart line at Christmas time is great. <laughs> you got 75 people standing in a line. you got a person in front of you. you got a person behind you. you got a captive audience. <laughs> I think uh, Sherry used to get, uh, he just, he's doing it again. <laughs> but there is nothing bolder than sharing Christ with a complete stranger. And there is no greater feeling in this world than that complete stranger who you've just shared Christ with, accepts Jesus Christ as their Savior. Now they're a brother or sister in the Lord with you. That is, there is no greater feeling than that. None. I could spend a lot more time in here because I, I love talking about evangelism and going out and sharing Christ with people. We need to move on. Verses 8 and 9. Then the disciple who had reached the tomb first also went in, and he saw and believed. 
For until then, they still had numbers of the scriptures that said Jesus must rise from the dead. So now we have John, the one who Jesus loved. John had his issues. John and his brother James were the ones who wanted to call down fire on other people that were uh, listening to what Jesus said and were doing what Jesus said to do. He wanted to call fire down on, hey, they're not with us. Pastor Ron, you got any churches we want to call fire down on today? No, we don't. He wanted a seat of prominence next to Jesus when Jesus came into his kingdom. But there was something special about John because he's referred to as the one that Jesus loved. John saw and believed, but don't be misled by this statement. He saw the empty grave, then he believed. The Lord wants us to believe by faith. And see the empty grave as evidence that our faith is correct. John may have been the one that Jesus loved, but the truth is, despite that title, John was not always the first guy to step up. He was not always a leader, and he often hesitated where Peter would move in boldly, just throw caution to the wind. And after the start of the church, you notice in the book of Acts, Peter and John were together a lot. John was with somebody until later years in life. But there was something about him that made him appear to be a friend of God. Everyone else ran from the Garden of Gethsemane when Jesus was taken prisoner. But you notice John followed along. John was in the courtyard. He knew people. He stayed close to Jesus. John was at the cross when all the other disciples were in hiding. John is the one who took Mary, the mother of Jesus, into his home. And history reveals that he took that very seriously all the way into the later parts of his life, wherever he was. According to history, Mary was there with him. John gave us the book of John. He gave us the letters, 1 John, 2 John, 3 John. And he is also the one who received the Revelation, the book of Revelation as we know. And he, he represents people that truly love God and are more important than you realize. So the fourth group of people who benefit from the resurrection, Christ-loving people benefit from the resurrection. Christ-loving people benefiting from the resurrection is a no-dumb moment for you this morning. You all believe that, right? Christ-loving people benefited from the resurrection. I'm going to tell you why. If Jesus Christ did not rise from the dead, why are we here? If Jesus didn't rise from the dead, we could be the Cumberland Community Group of Wishful Thinkers. We could be the Cumberland Community Religious Club. Now it says we're the church. The Apostle Paul said in 1 Corinthians 15, 14, If Christ has not been raised, then all our preaching is useless and your faith is useless. Preaching of the word is not useless. Isaiah 55, 11, I think it is, but it basically says... When the word of the Lord goes out, it does not come back void. It can have an effect on somebody if they're willing to receive that. Faith is not useless. A true and faithful Christ follower is the greatest visual example we have to look at in a crisis. While everyone else is panicking, the faithful Christ follower is praying. Doubt looks down. When you're a doubt man, you know the tops of your shoes better than anyone because anxiety looks around. What's going to happen next? The faith looks up. Looks up to the risen Savior. Sometimes the hardest thing that we have to do is believe the God who is unseen when we have that mountain of a problem right in front of us that we can clearly see it. We don't know what to do with it. 
It's hard to, it's easy to love Christ when well, things are going good, isn't it? Oh, I, I'm a, yeah, Jesus is good to me. Had a good week at work. I often had a saying when I left work, the house is still standing and nobody got it hurt. It's a good thing. But uh, it's hard to love Christ when the devil and this world are running over you. Let me tell you something about the Apostle John that you may not know. Uh, there was a Roman emperor by the name of Domitian, and he was persecuting Christians, and he got his hands on John. And Domitian, he, he liked to boil people in oil. You ever, boil, you ever deep fry wings or french fries or anything like that? You ever get a little bit of grease on you? It hurts, right? Domitian, the Roman emperor, would boil Christians in oil to get them to recant their Christianity. And the truth of the matter is, he lowered John down into the oil, nothing happened. John came out of the oil, did not have a mark on him. Domitian was so frightened by this, he said, away with you to Patmos. Patmos, he goes to the island of Patmos, a lifeless rock, limited water supply. Uh, no shelter there. He was so freaked out by the power of God it was working on that he exiled into Patmos. And it's a good thing he did. Otherwise, we would not have the book of Revelation. Okay, I know we're in the middle of the woke movement. <laughs> Ain't nobody here getting boiled in oil. And let's face it, nobody here is really getting persecuted for your faith. Right. I often say what we need is a good, good old-fashioned persecution to get the church up and running and doing what the church is supposed to do. I've said for years, I would rather have 30 people on fire for Christ in my church than 300 cute potatoes. Chair potatoes in this case. And you know what that time's coming, friends. Things are not going to get better from a worldly perspective. There is nothing in this book that I hold dear in my heart that says things are going to get better for us until Christ comes back. We're not home, are we? This isn't heaven. It snowed this week. Are you kidding me? This isn't heaven. It's too cold, it's too hot. But we're not home yet. But I am going to tell you this. Now is the time for the church to rise up and be the church. And that's why Sherry and I are here. We honestly feel like this is the place that the church is being the church. Things are going on. We don't have a bunch of spectators. There's plenty of churches out there that are spectators. Uh, they put on performances. But... We was going through the membership class last week, but one thing this man said that really stuck with me, he's our reality check. So when you get too far off base, reality check, I'll get that on a t-shirt for you. I'll do a reality <laughs> check. We can't be a bunch of spectators any longer. We have to go out and do what the church is supposed to do, what the Lord called us to do. Going and making disciples, baptizing, witnessing to people, praying for people, sharing Christ. Well, I can't do that. Tell me your story. How did you come to know Christ? It's an easy story. You know your own story about Christ. It's the easy story you can tell. <clears throat> All right, let's go ahead and look at the last verse. Then they went home. You would think, wow, how's he going to get anything out of that? Okay, after Peter and John saw and believed, they went home. John's gospel goes on to say that Mary stayed near the tomb. And she was not yet believing that Christ had risen from the dead. She was still under the assumption that somebody had taken his body. There's one common thing here that I do not want to get lost today. That is the fifth point I want to bring home to you, and that is nobody believed there would be nobody. To most people, dead means dead, right? 
No heartbeat, no brain activity, not breathing, dead. Jesus did raise Lazarus from the dead, but who was going to raise Jesus from the dead? And despite everything we have at our disposal in the Bible, many people still want to believe that there is no way that Jesus Christ rose from the dead. <clears throat> but not only do we have four gospel accounts, and several references made in the book of Acts, and the Apostle Paul alludes to it in some of his letters. We also have recordings in Roman history. And as for us, none of us were there. We do not have a clear, first-hand account of what happened. And so that comes down to the faith I was talking about earlier. The God of the Bible is faithful and true. Can you tell me one time that he ever let you down? I can't. His record is flawless. I've let myself down. I've let my wife down. I've let a lot of people down over the years. But God is faithful. Do you have the faith to believe that the power of God raised Jesus from the dead? Do you have the faith to believe that the Bible in its entirety is accurate and true? <coughs> Do you have the faith to believe that Christ rose from the dead and you have forgiveness of sin? Do you have the faith to believe that a relationship with Christ can make broken people whole, prideful people humble, and bold people turn the world upside down around them for the sake of the gospel? Do you believe that? Oh, my. You're not convincing me at all. <laughs> you have the faith to believe that you have the ability to be a mountain-moving Christ follower. Yes. It says you only need a mustard seed-sized grain of faith to move mountains. We don't need any more Alexa or Surrey. This world needs a Holy Spirit-led, Scripture-fed, church that wants to take the gospel to the ends of the earth and help people understand how to get to heaven. And friends, if you're a Christian, I'm here to tell you this is too good to keep to yourself. We can't keep it like it's a secret. Jesus said you can't light a lamp and put it under a basket. It's too good. It's the, the secret's out. We need to get that secret out there. And uh, as, as we close, I want you to keep in mind, regardless of what a person has done, they still need Jesus and benefit from the resurrection. And if you don't know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior of your life, you can have that assurance today of going to heaven. It's as simple as asking him to forgive you of your sins, turning from those sins, and entering into a relationship with Jesus Christ. Remember, it's not religion. It's not works. It's a relationship with him, following what his word says, believing what his word says, applying it to your life, being a living example of what a Christian life looks like. You came here today and you're hurt or broken by life. I'm happy to pray with you. I'm happy to pray for you. But do not leave here without knowing for certain that you're going to go to heaven because life is uncertain. Death is for sure. Sin is the disease. And Christ is the cure. Thank you for allowing this, me this opportunity to share with you. It's been a while. The last time I did this was uh, in front of a computer doing a Zoom church service that uh, somebody asked me to preach for. Uh, so this has been a, a refreshing change for me to get back up here in, in front of people again. And thank you for staying awake, thank you for not throwing vegetables at me, and thank you for being the church that we believe that you are. Let's all join me in prayer. Well, Father God, we thank you for the, just the confirmation that Jesus Christ is alive, and he's at work, and he's at your right hand. And Father, we thank you for this assurance that we can have of no matter where we are in life, that we benefit from his resurrection. Lord, I thank you for the people that are here with me today. I pray that you would stir inside them uh, something that would uh, 
blow people's minds even if you told them it was going to happen. I thank you for this church, and Lord, I do pray and ask that you would guide us and direct us to turn the world upside down for the sake of the gospel. Thank you for hearing our prayers, Lord. Thank you for taking care of all of our needs. Above all things, may your will be done. Lord, in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.